Welcome to Indie by Design episode 9. This is the show in which we sit down and talk to game designers to understand their motivations, philosophies and goals. We're on Twitter at Indie by Design or you can visit us on our website indiebydesign.net. The show is brought to you by Stace Harmon and John Robertson and in this episode, me, John Robertson, I'm joined by Jason Rora, the man behind revered works such as Passage, The Castle Doctrine and Sleep is Death. Rora might not be as well known as some other independent designers amongst the video game mainstream, but his influence is profound amongst his peers and those dedicated to game design. Here he talks to us about everything from his early influences to his perspective on originality in games, to how his home life impacts his designs, and what his take is on how people have reacted to what he has made. He begins by detailing his initial experiences with game design. Video game design, I've been doing it for 12 or 13 years, and I still feel like I'm a beginner, right? There's just like, it's 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 really, really uh, a difficult um, endeavor because uh, making a making a good game is really hard and there's not, you know, it's not really, we don't really have established kind of design rules or, or ways to go about making something good. So, um, and, you know, um, the history of my, my, my history as a game player is actually kind of littered with things. When I look back at them in retrospect, I, I realized that those things weren't really good games, <laughs> but I was playing them anyway. Right or playing them for other various other reasons. So I was born in 1977. Um, you know that's the year that Star Wars came out, right? And um, <laughs> and so born right into the sort of the beginning of the golden era of arcade uh, machines, and then uh, the the golden era of home uh, consoles with uh, things like the Atari 2600 and the Nintendo Entertainment System. And I eventually I never had a 2600, but I had a 7800. And um, Super Nintendo, uh, then PlayStation, Atari Jaguar, Atari Lynx, uh, and then Nintendo 64, and then PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3. Um, and then, you know, it's like that's my sort of trajectory where I was just like, you know, selling one video game system to buy another. Um, and I still have some, a few of them that I kept. Like I have my NES, but I think that's like the only old one that I have. Oh, I also had a Sega Dreamcast and I still have that. Um, but you know, I was just like a serial, like constantly reading, you know, serial console buyer, right. When the new console was coming out, I was always drooling over it. I was reading diehard game fan magazine with the glossy pictures of what was coming out for like Atari Jaguar, for example. And speaking of a game that, you know, in retrospect is not a very good game. Right. But I, it was like my favorite game when I was, I don't know how old it was. It must've been 13 or so. Uh, is Alien versus Predator on the uh, Atari Jaguar, right? So looking at Die Hard Game Fan Magazine as a kid, like the screenshots looked amazing. It almost looked like photorealistic, you know, with the way the aliens, uh, like uh, limbs and stuff looked on the screen. And it was 3D, you know, just like Wolfenstein or Doom. And actually, I think it was more like Wolfenstein with ceilings. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just the the fantasy aspect of it, like that I'm going to be able to step into the shoes of this alien or step into the shoes of this predator. And they had screenshots of, of the predator's uh, IR vision. And you had several different vision modes you could switch between for the predator, right? And, you know, in the game, you know, I don't even really remember, I was thinking back and talking to somebody about it recently, that was there any kind of explicit goal in it? You know, you could play in these three different roles and you kind of set down into the same maze, basically, from three different perspectives. And you're fighting against AIs of the other races, right? Like if you're a human, you're fighting against predators and, and aliens. And and if you're an alien, you're fighting against predators and humans. Uh, but it's single player, right? And so, you know, I don't know. I, I, I It's just like, it was totally, it was like basically sold to us on the premise of this fantasy that was going to be fulfilled, right? That you're going to get to plant eggs in some marine, right? And 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 the feeling of doing that, I guess, was amazing to me as the uh, the kid of whatever age I was who was really into alien films, really into H.R. Geiger, really <laughs> mm-hmm. into Predator and whatever. But wow, there, you know, as a game designer looking back, it's like there's almost like nothing there, right? <laughs> Um, and I think in, in, in retrospect, if you hear people talk about Alien vs. Predator, they kind of talk about it as this really bad game. You know, it's like, a, you know, <laughs> like this like Trojan horse that snuck its way into our living rooms and disappointed everybody. And I guess there were probably people who were older than me and had more sophisticated tastes that saw it for what it was as players. But I, at the time, you know, it was just like the coolest thing in the world. Um, you know, and so, you know, we can't necessarily even... 
like as game designers really trust our own history and taste, right? Because we got, we got tricked by the, the amazing graphics <laughs> just as much. I used to go into GameStop or I guess it was called Walden Software actually before it was called Electronics Boutique or whatever. And, you know, be trying to figure out what game I wanted to buy. And I flip to the back of the box and look at those three screenshots, right? And like put one down. Oh, this one doesn't have good graphics. Oh, this one doesn't have. Oh, look at this one. Kasumi Ninja for the <laughs> for the Atari Jaguar. It almost looks like photo real photos of people fighting, right? And I brought it home and it was the most broken, stupid fighting game I've ever played. And I ended up returning it, right? But those screenshots looked amazing, right? So I I uh, I fell for flashy graphics all the way up until. You know, all the way up through PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3, even as an adult, right? There's still the th these things where I'll see something and be like, oh, look at that. I've never seen a game that looked that amazing. I got to be, I got to experience that, right? But then uh, later in my adulthood, I realized that those, that experience of delight that you have with the surface of a game is extremely fleeting, right? Like you're, 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 you're surprised by it and amazed by it uh, for a very short amount of time. So then, you know, I was like, well, what are we really here for? Like, what's the sort of like, you know, long term kind of thing that we're doing with games? It clearly isn't. Wow. These graphics are amazing. Right. Because uh, I feel, only feel amazed for about an hour. <laughs> and then it just kind of becomes the way games look. Yeah, right? and, and, and when and, the next and game comes out with better graphics and the previous one becomes redundant almost in, in that in that sense right and going back to look at these games that at the time wowed us with amazing graphics there's like nothing left there right like alien versus mm. predator had some of the most amazing graphics i'd ever seen at the time i played it but it looks like you know garbage now right yeah. well maybe now it's 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 so trashy that it actually looks cool in retro right um but you go back and look at like you know some of the nintendo 64 stuff and it just you know it blew my mind graphically when i first saw it it's just like, oh my gosh, this is so, like, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not pixelated and so strange looking that it becomes cool in its own way. It's kind of like in this weird, ugly middle ground of like, you know, like little like scoop hands, yeah, yeah. <laughs> scoop hands and bad guru shading, right? <laughs> and uh, and anyway, so you know, as a game designer, I start was noticing these things, right? Or when I was thinking about wanting to make games and trying to kind of get to the bottom of why this happened to me, basically what happened to me is as I grew up um, and I went through all these different consoles and kept chasing after the next thing, that sort of petered out. And, you know, <clears throat> clearly, even though graphics are still getting better, they're not really getting better mm -hmm. at the rate, at the with the leaps and bounds that they were getting better between Nintendo and Super Nintendo or Super Nintendo and Jaguar, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so... If you, you know, does Uncharted 4 look all that much better than Uncharted 3 on the PlayStation uh, 3? Well, I guess if you really have an HD TV and you get real close to the screen or something, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in general, it's like things look a little bit more real, a little bit more shaded, a little bit more detailed. But, you know, it's not like night and day, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of like that. That is sort of petered out. I no longer see I, I haven't seen a game in years that made me say oh my gosh i've never seen a game that amazing looking i gotta gotta experience that right mm -hmm. um and then on top of it i felt that experience was pretty fleeting so um trying to think you know as a game designer my sort of mission i guess i felt especially in the beginning was to take that experience that i had as a game player and and figure out kind of where to go with it yeah so what are you um you're saying that something like Alien vs Predator is not a, a sort of a good game. Um, what? Would well, in terms you of then... game, in, in terms of game design, right? <laughs> like, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, so, it doesn't, so what... you know, it doesn't let you do something really new. <clears throat> it, it lets you basically try out these new abilities that are cool to try out just for their visceral nature. But how many times are you going to, you know, I don't know what the name of that alien mouth is. That's like a jack in the box that comes out. I mean, you have you have control over that mouth in the game, and you can go up to people and do that to them, right? <laughs> and you can plant an egg in them, and then they turn into a cocoon or something, you know. And then later on, another alien will hatch out of the egg, which gives you an extra life, right? And so it's like those are the kind of the mechanics, right? But it's more like there's nothing really to, rich to do with the mechanics. There's no trade offs. There's no interesting decisions to make. There's no, you know, even execution kind of things to get good at. Really, it's 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 more like. I don't know, maybe it's almost just like a toy, right? It's like this like toy where you get to play as an alien and pretend it's like an alien costume, you know? <laughs> and so as a designer, when I'm looking at, you know, game designs that are brilliant or have some, you know, I, I think, you know, Pac-Man is a, uh, a much 
kind of even though it's way simpler and there's way less of this like kind of like you know costume dress up aspect and all these other things that would sell a game to somebody you know in the uh in the mid 90s um you know as a design it still got all these cool tightly balanced little elements that um you know i'll sit down and play pac-man i mean for the rest of my life i will play pac-man and even though i mean pac-man wasn't that big of a thing for me when I was growing up. It was kind of a little bit before my time and it was kind of a slightly older game, you know, by the time I started paying attention to arcade games. But, you know, anytime I walk around and I see a Pac-Man machine, which they still exist and they exist for a reason, right? If I put a quarter in, it's an interesting experience that I'm like, you know, vying against the system and it's very simple rules and it's very tightly constructed. And, you know, I, I look at that kind of thing and be like, wow, that, I mean, we're not playing Pac-Man for its graphics and we never were, right? <laughs> um. And so that is the kind of thing that I'm, I'm I'm sort of thinking about as a designer now, looking back at these games and kind of like figuring out which are the ones that were really good, which are the ones that stand the test of time. I mean, no, but is there a single person on Earth today at this moment who is playing Alien versus Predator on the Jaguar? That's an interesting question. And how many people at this moment are playing Ms. Pac-Man? I'm sure there's like thousands, right? Um, and and so yeah, it's like why why is that? And that's you know. Um, how many people are playing Uncharted One right now? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So was so is part of your kind of um, your goal, if I could put it in such a sort of structured terminology, to create things that are more they are more evergreen, they are more they are more lasting, they have a they have an impact beyond their their kind of um, technological boundaries in that you know they're not a slave to the to whatever the the coolest or the most spectacular piece of imagery you can create at the time is is does that come into your thinking when you're creating games that you explicitly want them to stand the test of time or is that kind of a is that a happy accident that's that's been arrived at through some sort of subconscious or just some sort of sheer fluke yeah, so it's not really driven by, you know, longevity of the work. I'm not sitting here saying, well, how am I going to make a game that, you know, like outlasts me or whatever, right? <laughs> I'm reminded of Michael Jackson at the end of his life apparently had the realization that he uh, he really wanted to get into into being in films. And there's some quotes from him where he was talking about, uh, you know, how he saw, like he looks back at these, like Audrey Hepburn or some of these stars who are now deceased and is Audrey Hepburn deceased? I think she is. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> and, sure. And and, uh, and and you know they they are basically immortalized in these films. And he was at the end, toward the end of his life, thinking about you know his legacy and immortality and so on, and like realizing that you know his his full persona is not really captured in these recordings that he made, right? And that he really needs to start churning his career toward becoming a movie star, <laughs> you know? And, and how 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 likely that was? And maybe this is an urban legend or something, but just even thinking about it as 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 an allegory, right? Like. You know how likely it was for someone like Michael Jackson at the end of his life to have a successful movie career, um, <laughs> yeah. and and his desire to do that, or somebody's desire to do that for longevity and so on, is is just an interesting thing to think about. So yes, I'm not I'm not sitting here saying how do I make my works, you know, you know, be as timeless as Pac Man. Um, I'm more thinking about it as a designer, right? And and um, when I think about video games or games and what they are and how they function, I think. One of the unique things about them is that they can have this kind of depth to them, right? That um, other works in other mediums don't necessarily have, right? You don't really like read a novel to completion and then immediately turn around and read it again, right? Mm. <laughs> you don't really go to a movie and, you know, every once in a while I hear stories about, oh, we saw, you know, Rogue One you know, or whatever, <laughs> three times in one weekend. It was awesome. You mm. know, and I've heard about that, but you know, that's not the normal way that you do it. Right. And so, um, because, you know, video games are interactive and they have, um, you know, they're not just these linear, completely understandable, completely consumable experiences. There's this potential for them to have these systems inside of them that, you know, produce a, a, a deeply explorable experience that you never really kind of complete. And I sort, of, I sort of see them as like, you know, because they have these unique capabilities, it's like, well, their sort of ideal form is, is exercising those unique capabilities to, to the maximum, right? 
Mm. Um, and it, you know, I don't know. We talk, you talk about other mediums is like, well, yes, you know, uh, a movie could put up like, you know, at the beginning of star Wars, there's this block of text that goes up. Right. But it goes up for like two minutes at most. It doesn't go up the entire movie. Right. It's not like you go to some movie to sit there and read block after block of text on the screen. And if somebody made a movie that way, even if it was the most amazing story in the world, even if it was better than any novel, um, people would be like, but what's the point? I don't want to, if I, you know, I don't want to go into this movie and read this block of text. Mm-hmm. Like that's not what movies do. That's not their strong point. Their strong point is like having a camera and showing action, passing over time on camera and moving the camera around while that's happening and, and editing those bits of action together into some sort of cohesive visual uh, drama that spans over time. Right. And so, you know, we clearly would say, for, you know, any movie that wasn't exercising those, uh, capabilities those unique capabilities would be sort of faulty right a movie that had nothing but still pictures one after another like a slideshow you know for for the entire thing would be like well that but movies can do more than that right we didn't mm-hmm. you know yeah it's kind of cool to experiment with this like weird way to like to limit yourself and constrain yourself for a film but movies could do way more than that or you know and uh, uh andy warhol's empire state building where he just aims the camera at the empire state building for 10 hours <laughs> and it's a 10 hour long film it's like okay it is a film <laughs> technically but you know, films can do so much more than that, right? They can have sound and characters talking and different scenes edited together. And so anyway, uh, I feel like we can do unique things with games. And it's like, well, if we can do these things, and these are some of the most powerful experiences, and they turn out to be the most timeless experiences just kind of by chance because those are the kinds of things that people want to explore deeply and play deeply. Those are the kinds of games people actually like at the end of the day, right? <laughs> Too. It's like they co- coincide with that, right? So that is sort of becomes this like ideal for a designer to be designing something, right? It's like, I want to design a good quote, scare quote, good game. And by good, <clears throat> I mean uh, these, these things that I'm describing, which is like, you know, deep, systemic explorable you know never the same twice always something new to learn about it um something you can play for the rest of your life those kinds of things because games are capable of doing that that's kind of like and so there we kind of are able to sort of maybe define what the highest form of a game is or what the most perfect kind of game would be if we could imagine it right and then and then work our way toward that somehow and then realize that yeah there's all these other things we can do with games but they in the long term they're kind of unsatisfying somehow right um and they don't um live and breathe and function as games the same way something like ms pac-man chess poker basketball (laughs) um uh, league of legends you know these things that you know have these properties that i'm talking about um they also happen to be the most popular games they're also played the most deeply i mean i guess there's also this feeling like if you make like if you think about Passage, right, which is my most well-known game, right? It's like, mm. yeah, it's been played by more people than any of my other games. It's been downloaded more times, whatever, and people have talked about it way more than anything I've ever done. But most people played it, and there was some depth to Passage. I'm not saying it's as deep as Pac-Man, not nearly as as deep as that game. But most people played it in this very shallow, cursory way, right? They play this one little five-minute long life. A lot of people don't even realize you can walk down and explore a maze. They don't know there's a maze. They just walk to the right on the, uh, on the clear path that's at the top. They meet the spouse. Uh, spoiler, they live for five minutes, get older, and, and the spouse dies, and then they die, and they see this little movie or whatever, and they're like, oh, my gosh, and then they go and comment and, uh, on, the, on the blog comment roll or whatever, right? Mm. Um, and so there is more to Passage than that, and some people have explored it and seen the maze and found treasure chests and these other things, and some people have noticed there's a score and tried to figure out how the score works and balance their score and so on, but... You know, it's like they, they maybe played it three times. There wasn't even a reason for them to go deep into any of those things and figure those things out, even though I put those things in there, right? So it's mm-hmm. like there's this tendency, I guess, for there to be this very sort of surface play or surface reading of, of a work when the work doesn't have any reason why you should really go any deeper into it, right? Where if you look at the way that players play and analyze and study and pick apart something like League of Legends. I mean, it is just, you know, I'm a student of League of Legends myself and I've been playing for three years and, you know, like I have, you know, gone way deep into it in terms of analyzing little nuances of how different champions play and what different items do and, and what the proper build is and what the experts are doing and 
and there's this dialogue and I post questions sometimes in different forums and get answers and argue about things like, you know, how many people are arguing about the game design of passage? Right. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like, and, and so I feel like Pac-Man is the same way, right? People who, there are these people who become experts at it. There are people who have like found every little nuance of it. They, people who have studied exactly the way the ghosts move and, and, and everything. And it's sort of like, that is what a deep, like comprehensive reading of a work is right now. I feel like we have the potential for that in games. And that is like one of the most beautiful things that can happen with a game. And especially with video games. And if we look at video games as like a bulk, uh, you know, collection of all the things that have been made over the past 25 years, you know, there's almost nothing mm. <laughs> that is like mm. that. Right. Yeah. Um, you know how many like there's like whole shelves at the library devoted to chess, whole shelves devoted to poker. You know, is there any single video game <laughs> in the last 25 years that has even a single book about it? Yeah. In terms yeah. of like studying it deeply and really reading into it, and you know, I mean, so um, I yeah, I guess I feel like that there's something special about games in the way that they can do that, the way they can support this kind of deep study and tapping into that is sort of tapping into something that's core about them and when we say we're, we're a game is good or i go back and look at alien versus predator and say it's not good i'm i'm kind of looking at it through that lens i guess right and is it is mm. it you know was it good at the time was it actually an amazing game at the time because i loved it as a 12 or 13 year old does that you know is that all that matters right or is there something more fundamental about these things that we can look at a little bit more objectively it's like games are kind of these weird hybrids of subjective art artistry uh creative decisions putting you know personal elements and story and characters and so on that are you know can we can i can you tell me whether you know um luke skywalker or indiana jones is a better character right that's we can have a subjective argument about that there's no way to prove one way or the other but video games on the other hand are also pieces of engineering right like i can prove to you that the building you're going to build is going to fall down <laughs> like with with uh with physics <laughs> when I look at your design right and and a video game can be sort of provably broken in terms of well it's code crashes in these certain situations but even more so like the design can be broken in a mathematical sense right I can find a Nash equilibrium in your multiplayer game which essentially proves that this game is broken mathematically right and so there's this weird kind of mix of these two things we can we can argue about these things in terms of opinions but then we can also argue about them we can also in some ways almost measure them objectively, right? Um, we can say objectively, it's objectively true that checkers is a deeper game than tic-tac-toe, right? <laughs> it's not up to, it's not a matter of opinion, right? <laughs> there's more, there's more that like check a checkers is harder. You can get better at it. There's more skill uh, rungs in the skill ladder In tic-tac-toe. There's like three rungs, <laughs> you know? And, and once you get to the rung where you always know how to tie the other person, that's as high as you can go, right? Um, and so, and we can also objectively say that chess is deeper than checkers, and we can say that Go is deeper than chess, you know, and like we can say that League of Legends is deeper than Passage. Um, so it's a, so it's a real thing. It's like so maybe you know maybe I'm sort of I guess trying to shift away from this kind of wishy washy which games do I like for emotional reasons and trying to get somehow at their core or something like a deeper truth about them. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to pick up on there. What you, what you were saying um, in regards to different readings of passage or maybe a lack of a, 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 um, an interesting reading or a worthwhile one. Um, I mean, it reminds me of um, a lot of people's kind of reaction to conceptual art all through the ages to an extent like they they might appreciate an aesthetic level but they haven't really sort of completed the circle they haven't put themselves into it and and sort of finished the vision that um that you know the artist might have had it, the desire is for everyone to have a subjective reading on this thing um is that how you feel about your games as well that they they are all designed to have a a subjectiveness to them that's personal to the player or do you see them as having a definitive meaning that it, and whether you're prepared to share that meaning or not to, which would potentially break the break the sort of the tension and the sort of intrigue but do you yeah do you have a a objective meaning to the games that you 
um, that you create or do you design and prefer them to be subjectively kind of reacted to and responded to? Well, I guess it's it's, it's kind of somewhere in in a weird middle, I guess I'd say, because the things that I'm trying to, uh, you know, the, the meaning that I'm trying to convey with the games is something that I don't usually don't fully understand myself or can't put into words or, you know, couldn't summarize in any other way. Right. And so, you know, you could say, well, passage is about the passage of life. It's about the choices that you make in your life as you go along. It's about whether to have a life partner or not and what it's like to lose that partner. You know, that, that kind of summarizes, you know, things that are in passage. Right. Um, but whether you get passage or not or whether you the meaning has been conveyed or not is not whether you understood those surface things about it. Like, oh, I interpreted this correctly. It's about a guy getting older. I interpreted this correctly, you know. Once I hook up with the life partner, we can't fit in the narrow parts of the maze anymore. <laughs> like, I got it. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, there's compromise once you uh, hook up with a life partner. You know, like those kinds of surface things. There's also something like the, the, the core meaning of passage or like what I, I'm hoping to convey with it is something I can't quite put into words, right? It's like this certain co cocktail of feelings around these issues, right? Um, like... And I and and around the issues of the passage of life, around the issues of your life being finite, around realizations of the passage of time, and looking at yourself in the mirror and seeing that you're getting older, and how that feels, and how that 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 creeping void that's coming toward you um, feels, right? Mm. And and so I can't tell you exactly how that feels. I know how it feels <laughs> to me, mm. and and passage is like this little message in a bottle to other people, like. Here, I packed all this together. I think this kind of, you know, helps convey this kind of conveys these feelings or or supports these feelings or or maybe will recreate these feelings or remind you of these feelings in yourself and shove it out in the ocean and ho hope that somebody opens it. And it's like, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> I can't put it into words either, but I know what you mean. Right. Um, and so uh, Passage is a good example of that. There's other games, you know, that I made since Passage that, you know, have similar kinds of things. It's like you know, and inside a star-filled sky, which is about infinity, right? Um, and what it's like to grapple with infinity and how, like, mind-boggling it is, right? To, like, you know, if I if you, you play inside a star-filled sky for a while and you go up and down, you're like, oh, I made it all the way up to level 100. And I'm like, well, there's 2 billion levels, right? <laughs> and And each of those 2 billion levels has 10 monsters in it. And if you go inside one of those monsters... You can go down two billion levels deep in the, the side chains, right? So, and each of those spots in the side chain has 10 monsters in it, and each of those has another two billion side chain off the side of it, right? So, it's not just a tower of two billion levels, it's like a tree with a trunk that's two billion levels high and it has 10 branches at each level, and each branch has 10 branches going two billion, <laughs> you know, it's just like. When you start to like try and grapple with that, right? It gives you a feeling, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and um and so it also we're we're dealing with it on paper when I say when I talk about it, but we're like writing these numbers down, trying to calculate exactly how huge it is. I've never even done that, right? Um, you know, it's it's way bigger than the number of atoms in the known universe, way bigger than, you know, I don't know, it's just like it's not infinite though, it's finite. And the computer, which is a finite piece of hardware, can simulate all this and generate it on demand as needed, which is another mind boggling aspect of thinking about this, right? Like it's all predefined. Like when you go up to level 2 billion and go down five levels to the left and go in the green monster, you will find the same thing that's already predetermined there that anybody else who ever did that same trajectory would find exactly the same thing, even though no one's ever seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. one ever will see it, but if they ever did see it, it's, it's a known settled thing. It's not randomly generated, right? Like and the co computers can do that, you know, and and yet they're still finite. It's not like this is, you know, there's anything about that process. You know, you could count the number of levels and 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 draw a picture of each one and eventually be done drawing a picture of each one, you know. And so all that kind of stuff, sticking you in the middle of that, letting you grapple with it at like a, kind of the microbe level of going up and down in these few levels that you actually get to explore during human time and you know, f having these feelings of forgetting where you are and forgetting what the task that you were doing was when you rise back up out of some subtask that you chose to do an hour ago and got lost down inside of it, you know, that creates these, these feelings in you, um, that, 
you know, I guess I could summarize it as, well, it's a feeling of being small. You know? mm. <laughs> but even mm. if I use that word to describe it, that doesn't really capture the feeling of being small. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, so there is this sort of like, you know, I, I don't really hope that these things are just up to, you know, completely unfettered interpretation. Right. I don't I don't hope that, oh, anybody can read it however they want and they can see inside of Starfield Sky as, you know, a thing about childhood, you know, <laughs> you know. Just because they they read it that way and it reminded them of something, and isn't it great that that's you know there is this sort of like thing that it's about, but at the same time it's not like I could quiz you afterwards and find out whether you understood it or not. Right? If you're motivated to delve deeper into game design and game designers, then do make sure to check out Independent by Design: Art and Stories of Indie Game Creation. It's a hardback book that combines inside stories focused on specific studios and individuals, all of which are informed by tens of hours of original interviews, alongside compelling pages of original artwork and concept documents. 26 studios and individuals are included, such as Dean Hall of Daisy and Rocketworks fame, Devolver Digital, publishers of Stories Untold, Hotline Miami, Love Browsers and many more, Papers Please creator Lucas Pope and a whole host of other talented creators. So go to IndieByDesign.net to get your copy today. You can also follow us on Twitter at IndieByDesign and on Facebook by going to facebook.com slash independentbydesign. Our website, as well as being a portal through which to listen to our podcast and buy our book, is also full of interesting editorial content for you to read. Again, that's at IndieByDesign.net. We begin the second half of our chat with Jason Rohrer with him talking about how the creation of his games can be used to deal with issues affecting him in his own life. With Passage as a as a particular example, and then I'll talk a little bit about the Castle Doctrine in this context as well. Um, there's the you know, I mean, one of the things the Passage is about is is this feeling of existential terror, I guess. Um, and I don't know that the 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 work itself is, um, you know, really about conveying a feeling of existential terror. <laughs> But the work was driven by my feeling of existential terror, right? And when you know, and 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 sort of like, passage is is one of the answers to that existential terror that I had. Not oh, I'm going to create a game about this, but the the way that the game represents life and represents this, uh, life as a story with a beginning, middle, and end, and as a kind of a complete picture, right? That is sort of has to be that way to be complete, and has to be that way to, you know be what it is right um that that's this sort of maybe one soothing answer to existential terror right (laughs) um and uh but at the same time it's like well that even when making passage that that and and hoping that this is sort of like an answer uh like this this little philosophy that's encapsulated in this game and these feelings that are encapsulated in this game you know or sort of a way to deal with this existential terror the existential terror didn't go away i always said i always said that Passage was my one of, like, sort of an attempt to deal with this, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, even when giving talks about Passage back in the old days, when you know Passage was like this, you know, the, one of the only games that I made that people knew about, and oh, you know, uh, people wanted you to come and give a talk just about Passage or how you made it or whatever. I remember standing up in front of the audience and talking to them about existential terror, and you know, talking about Passage as being, you know either a way to deal with it or as a sort of message in a bottle to other people about these issues and how alone the existential terror feels, right? Because it's like, this is like death in your own personal death and the end of your own life. It's something that you have to deal with. You are going to face alone, right? No matter what, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe unless you and your life partner commit suicide at the same moment, which is very romantic and I guess happens every once in a while, but that doesn't happen to most people. <laughs> and even Well, if you, religion's quite popular. Even if, even if you didn't, well, I'm saying even in religion, right? Even if you buy, if you even if you uh, subscribe to a given religion that says you, you, this isn't the end of your life, you still have to face the process of death and whatever you're going to face immediately afterwards on your own, right? If you're going to be standing mm. up in front of the pearly gates, <laughs> you're standing <laughs> yeah. there on your own, buddy. You're not, you know, if, or you're going to be being judged by God or what or whatever it is you're going to be doing on your own, right? Um, and so that, you know, that even if I could believe those things or did believe those things, it wouldn't necessarily alleviate the aloneness of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, 
And so anyway, standing up in front of these audiences, I remember this feeling of existential terror kind of coming on at the moment. I'd be like, you know what? Even though I'm talking to you guys about this, even though I'm surrounded by people, I'm feeling it right now. And I'm kind of be like, you know, kind of aren't you guys feeling it too? And there would just be this like stone face silence as everyone's sort of sitting there <laughs> grappling with this. Um, you know, and so even 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 talking about passage or whatever or being in this surrounded by people who are all like, you know, wanting to hear what I have to say isn't isn't helping. You know, there's no there's not really any any way to help this help this feeling that I could tell. Um, so that's passage, uh, which I guess, you know, does sort of was sort of intended as a, as a, as a sort of a therapeutic solution. Um, and then uh, the castle doctrine. Yeah. It I mean, um, it was uh in you know greatly inspired by my own personal feelings as the you know de facto <laughs> involuntary uh you know protector of my family as a as a man um when i was my family was put in a, a couple of dangerous situations i had little kids or a baby or a pregnant spouse or whatever over the course of having three kids and trying to live in places that were cheap so that uh you know, we didn't spend a lot of money, so we could I could continue making games and whatever, right? Um, so you know, cheap places are usually cheap for a reason. Um, you, you know, even before like you know, we moved to this place that was Las Cruces, New Mexico, where we had the most problems with sort of violence or crime or those kinds of things that we've ever had. But you know, even if we think I think back about upstate New York, there was like we were living in a cheap house that actually ended up having a mold problem and ended up affecting my wife's health. And there was a time when she went to the emergency room and almost died from asthma from the mold, you know, and like, um, you know, I, I sort of even at that point, I sort of felt like I was kind of thrust into this role of, you know, managing or 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 shielding my family from these harms. And, and, and we eventually made the decision to you know move away from. Uh, upstate New York to get away from these problems that we we're having in this particular house. Um, but uh, the place we moved had its own problems, right? Places that are cheap are cheap for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the upstate New York was cheap because it got to 25 below Fahrenheit every winter. <laughs> uh, you know, Las Cruces was cheap because it was hot as hell and there are, you know, lo loose pit bulls running around all over the place. <laughs> you know? So, you know, you, you got to pick your, you got to pick your, uh, pick your poison i guess but anyway so now you know whereas before it's like okay maybe I, I i need to really think about you know you know these things that are affecting my family or health issues that are coming up now it's like this very sort of direct vectors of like physical harm right that like when and when they're happening i am thrust into this role of having to deal with it just because of the circumstances right mm -hmm. um you know in the case of my wife being attacked i mean she was like I'm trying to think of uh, how many months pregnant she was. So she must have been, uh, you know, like six or six months pregnant. Right. Um, and and she had our our toddler on the back of her bike. So she's in this very sort of helpless position. Right. <laughs> now, I had an older child on the back of my bike as I saw my wife being attacked by this dog. And, you know, I had to jump to action. I had to do something. The dog then ran at me after it bit her and like. I don't know if it's going to bite my child next. What? Right. So I'm like, but I'm completely helpless. I have no weapons, no way to defend myself. I kind of stick my foot out and kick the dog in the face with my barefooted sandal. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the dog just kind of, maybe it was just coming to see me. I don't know what, but after biting my wife, I wasn't <laughs> going to trust it to just come and see me. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, in this situation, I'm, I'm like all of a sudden like, okay, I got to jump up and the dog is still loose and it may come back. And, but we're in the middle of the road and I've got like two kids out here, one on my bike. I kind of set my bike down. My kid is kind of like flopped down because I need to jump up and get between the dog and my family. But like my wife can't jump up and get, do anything right in the situation that she's in. She's just been attacked. Right. And so I'm suddenly like, I'm not good at this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at being like a, a hero. I played the hero so many times, you know, played the hero so many times in video games um, and done the right thing so many times. But here I am thrust into a real situation, um, you know, and I don't want to overblow it. I mean, it's, you know, my wife's, my wife, um, my wife wasn't, wasn't maimed or anything. And it was mild compared to some things other people have experienced, but um, it still got me thinking about these things in a way that I hadn't really thought about them before. Um, and so, yeah, the castle doctrine is a way to, so, you know, I was, I was feeling, you know, worried about violation, feeling vulnerable, feeling like, you know, like, I don't know that, you know, 
these I didn't, these these feelings didn't bother me that much. I actually found them to be kind of like just another adventure in some ways. <laughs> but for my wife, it was just like the end of the line for her, right? She's just like, <laughs> you know, we eventually ended up moving away from Las Cruces because of how afraid she had become in this environment that we were in, right? And so, again, I'm thrust into this sort of like, you know, protect your role in this in the situation because of the way she feels about it versus the way I feel about it. Um, and she felt much more vulnerable than I did. Um, and so anyway, yeah. So castle doctrine kind of sprang out of all of that stuff. Like, what does it mean to be a man in these situations in this modern, these modern times where all these gender roles have been, been discarded. Right. And we're all equal and, you know, we don't really need to worry about these traditional roles anymore. Well, when, when the rubber hits the road though, and stuff starts happening, then these traditional roles kind of bubble back up. Right. Mm. and you know even if you think that you're not that kind of man or you don't want to be in that role sometimes in this situation well i, I didn't really have a choice right <laughs> um and so what does it mean to be a man what what does society say that it means what what do we think of men doing what do we um how do we envision them and you know castle doctrine is is cast in uh like the sort of the beginning of my teen years when i was observing the sort of peak of uh, paranoia in the United States about crime, right? Because crime was peaking, violent crime was peaking <laughs> to its maximum ever or something uh, in like 1991 or whatever. And that was when I was uh, uh, 12 or 13 or no, I guess I was 14. And, um, and uh, you know, my father, my father, or think back about him, he was, <laughs> he was kind of, he was pretty much terrified, right? In terms of like, how concerned he was about, you know, worrying about us or when we went certain parts of town or telling us to avoid certain parts of town or making sure we, we had a burglar alarm and making sure it was always set, even if we just went out to walk the dog, you know, <laughs> and, you know, he was being fed all the media at the time, which wasn't, um, uh, which wasn't, you know, inflammatory or whatever. It was like looking back on it. It was like, wow, I guess <laughs> My dad wasn't exaggerating things. I mean, because we're, it's like, we're like two or three times safer than we were in 1991 now in terms of violent crime in the United States. Mm. <laughs> you know, things have gotten so much better. It's just like crazy how much better. <laughs> like New York City had 3,000 murders in one year, right? <laughs> and like 89 or something. They just went like a whole month without a single murder <laughs> last year. Yeah. You know, it's just totally different. Like we don't even, I can't even imagine. If you didn't go to New York City at that time, you have no idea what it was like, right? Mm. Um, I go to New York City now and I'm like, what is uh, some people who are who lived through that time don't go to New York City still to this day. <laughs> I'm like, I go to New York City I'm like, what is the big deal here? Like, there's nothing. It doesn't feel dangerous at all. And like, you don't remember, you don't know what it's like, man. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, anyway. Yeah. So I, I kind of looked back at that lens from my childhood and, and, and the way. Uh, you know, burglary was depicted in media and advertising and um, that sort of, you know, ever present threat and tried to try to you know, build this bizarre little nightmare scenario in like, like this st st steeping in that, in that world. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. If, um, has it, has it ever come um, sort of full circle in the sense of um, something like, to stay on the castle doctrine? Like if that's influenced by, events both in your more recent pasts um with the um you know in those areas that you were living at and then also looking further back to the sort of childhoods um and the realities of crime in the states at that time um and that's influenced the castle doctrine has it come um has it ever reflected back and one of your games has either in the creation of it or the playing of it or the reading of criticism or watching other people play it as it reflected back and made you come to a different perception of that theme that you were that you were looking at one that you necessarily well you might not have necessarily had before you created it uh well obviously uh, you know the the reactions to the castle doctrine were extremely polarized, right? Uh, which I think is what you're what you're getting at here. Um, so I guess part of um, you know part of the problem with that polarized reaction is that people just didn't <laughs> didn't really understand 
didn't understand or you know and I, I, I don't know I, it's like is, you know is it my fault for not making a good enough game that people could understand or is it like I also feel like there's something um, because we're so we're because we're so used to seeing games that have none of this right <laughs> That when a game has this kind of thing, when it's about um, some sort of real complex issue and casting about for emotional, you know, uh, casting about an emotional territory about that issue and so on um, in a way that is nuanced and doesn't have one clear, like, you know, ham handed kind of way to interpret it, that we're just sort of lost for tools and and capabilities to to interpret the thing. Right. Mm. Um, And so. You know, it's like either this is Jason Rohr's treatise on why everyone, you know, should be, you know, every, you know, cause he's a libertarian, right? Everyone should be armed and should be shooting everybody who steps on their doorstep, mm. <laughs> you know, uh, th- or this is clearly, you know, meant to lampoon that position, right? Of self-defense, right? It's meant to show like how this, you know, it's, it's from a liberal point of view that this is, you know, uh, what nightmare scenario would erupt if we actually did uh enact vigilante revenge and self-defense in the way that this game depicts it's a nightmare world and clearly it's meant to show, hold a mirror up to our gun crazy culture right <laughs> you know is it one is it that it has to be either that or it has to be you know him having his 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 violent fantasy <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah you know the even on the website it talks about it being 1991 right you know it it, it, it really kind of spells things out for people if they actually stop to look at any of this stuff but these people are not even aware. The people who are making the criticisms of the Castle Doctrine are not even aware there was a peak of violent crime in 19... 19- they don't even know what that date means, right? They're just totally, like, incapable of, of like, grappling with the things that, that, that the game is supposed to grapple with at the scale that it grapples with them, right? Whereas if you look at the way, you know, filmmakers, artists, other people outside of games reacted to something like the Castle Doctrine, you know, they, they're able to they have the, the equipment with which to understand it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been so many, the other thing is like the history of video games is littered with these sensationalistic, violent, you know, violent f- f- power fantasy type things like postal. Right. <laughs> or even if we go back to like doom or quake or, you know, things where you can sh- cut somebody in half with a chainsaw. And, oh, isn't it awesome to see all that blood, you know, and Gibbs mm-hmm. and all this headshots and all this kind of stuff <laughs> that, um, I don't know. I, I even saw people say like something. There was a couple of people who said, oh, no, this is going to be just like Hotline Miami in terms of the way that it's going to become a huge success. And, you know, the Castle Doctrine didn't exactly become a huge success. But what does it mean when we say, oh, no, it's going to be just like Hotline Miami where you have like, you know, Cactus, who's this relative, you know, relative, apparently relatively sensitive, artistic, you know, <laughs> s- Swedish dude, uh. <laughs> all of a sudden making this, you know, completely violent over the top thing and and uh having it be the biggest success he's ever had and catapult him into the millionaire club right yeah. um and isn't it you know i guess they're trying to say isn't it sad or something that that these kinds of games like people still have a thirst for them or something um and so yeah i don't know i mean i'm not i i don't i mean i, I played and enjoyed hotline miami very much <laughs> <laughs> but you know and i i do uh enjoy i, I feel like it's it's operating in a in an artistic space that I've seen countless filmmakers operate in, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we don't need to, like, you know, we don't ever really call them on the carpet in the same way that we're calling these game makers on the carpet for, like, pandering to people's bloodlust or something. Mm -hmm. You know, when I go see a Martin Scorsese film or read reviews of a Martin Scorsese film, they're never, like, you know, chastising Martin Scorsese for continuing a lifelong career of pandering to people's (laughs) bloodlust. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, they're talking about the greater themes and, you know, he's operating, you know, this is a movie about gangsters, but it's really about more than that. And look at his kinetic camera work. And, you know, um, and, and so it's like they're like equipped to kind of deal with this instead of just dealing with it on its face. Right. Like, you know, Castle Doctrine is a game where you're going to get a thrill out of murdering wives and children. <laughs> like, that's what it is. Right. <laughs> How many wives and children have been, you know, attacked or murdered in films? And we never, like, look at it in that way, right? It's like, yeah. you know, the movie Memento, you know, his wife is killed, right? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it to thrill us over the killing of a wife? No, it's not even a, it's just like a, a thing in this, in this thriller genre, right? Yeah, it's just a device. Yeah, the, the, I wonder, does, does that bias kind of annoy you? Like, um, 
Uh, we're talking about bias in terms of people would come to the castle doctrine with a preconceived idea, whether their political ide- ideology is left or right, or um, and also in in the in I guess it's a form of bias in that people will just look at it in isolation as a video game as opposed to taking into account a wider cultural sort of structure within which it was developed and and released into um i suppose do you do you get irritated by that that limited perspective or or is it something that you used to be annoyed by but now you're you're more experienced and you've you've undergone more exposure to these kind of reactions it's something that doesn't really bother you at all um and i suppose leading on from that like do you even with the kinds of games you make i mean there's 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 you know there's this kind of uh, it's, it's, it's beginning to get inane now but there's this question about like is this a game is that a game what even is a game um do you even see yourself as part of the game industry in in that sense right so i mean i guess one question is you know did i did i learn some kind of lesson from castle doctrine and be like you know oh obviously you know <laughs> like be like these things are going to be judged in terms of you know other games and so on and so yeah. therefore i need to sort of toe that line or expect that reaction um i mean i guess i'm i'm somewhat disappointed that you know i feel like this kind of stuff you know this this boundary pushing stuff this stuff that you know bites off more than it can chew the stuff that reaches um, is the stuff that we're we're sorely m- not lacking. I'm not saying the Castle Doctrine is so, like the world is sorely lacking for lack of something like the Castle Doctrine. I'm just saying like that's a kind of stuff I I think we should be doing in general, right? Like we should be doing things that reach and have the tendency to maybe confuse people or make them really have to study to get a good critical interpretation of it or whatever. These things that are much more simpler and like you know I don't know a lot of the the more recent sort of narrative games. I don't know, maybe could be compared to like young adult fiction or something in terms of the simplicity, simplicity of their themes. Yeah. Um, and there's a pretty famous article by Ian Pogost over the last uh, week or so that he kind of talked about it in those terms. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, like I, you know, I, I think um, we should be making this difficult, challenging kind of crazy, you know, off the beaten path kind of stuff. And you know, if people aren't ready for it or don't know how to interpret it, well, that shouldn't stop us from making it. It's like these are maybe the growing pains that we need to have along the way to be able to, you know, get to the point of, you know, I don't know, someone like, you know, Lars von Trier or, you know, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like, you know, it's like, well, what do you expect? What do you expect this to feel like, right? When, you know, we're used to games being very simple, having black and white heroes and villains and so on. And, and, um, and then we start getting into this, you know, murkier, more, you know, sophisticated territory. Um, you know, there's going to be these like kind of leaps that take place that kind of don't feel like they make sense in the context and history of like all the other games we played this year or whatever. And that's what they're going to look like. They're going to (laughs) be, They're gonna be they're gonna be weird and difficult and and hard to critique, you know, given the framework that we have, and that shouldn't stop us from making them. Um, and you know, there were lots of people who got the Castle Doctrine, right? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it was my most critically successful game. Um, hopefully not for the reasons that they suggest Hotline Miami was critically, critically successful. Hopefully not just because it fulfilled some bloodlust or desire to kill women and children, right? I you know I think it also tapped into, um, you know, the people who played it and liked it and played it very deeply and whatever, which, you know, there was enough of them to have me make a living off of the game. Um, you know, I think they got where I was coming from and they got the emotional kind of content that was there. And, and then, you know, other people outside of the world of games who've come to me and been like, you know, really like the castle doctrine trailer. I mean, there's currently a group of people working on a castle doctrine movie right now. Right. And, you know, in all the conversations I've had with them, they never, they're coming from the film world. Right. And they watched my trailer and saw what it depicted and so on. And they, they never once like raised an eyebrow about it's, you know, uh, political implications or whatever. It's like, this is this, this, this work of art that's operating in this territory. Right. That's all it is. Right. It's, it's, and it's free to do that in this territory and to raise whatever questions it raises and to poke and prod in the way that it pokes and prods. And they're like, 
we love the way this pokes and prods, right? Mm. <laughs> you know, we they, they're like kind of I don't know. I just felt like they were equipped to to get it right. Um, and so, but you know, they're dealing. You know, they're operating in the film industry, right? Where you know, poking and prodding and and challenging people and surprising people and you know is like kind of like the bread and butter, right? <laughs> You know, they're they're sitting there with like you know films like The Purge behind them. Right? I mean, you think the Castle Doctrine is like you know should be a lightning rod? I mean, what about I mean, there's just like mainstream successful films like The Purge that are way <laughs> pushing boundaries way beyond that, right? Um, and so I don't know. I just feel like we're just like like what you know like we're, we're kind of like well, should we keep this little straight jacket on? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting to put it in that terms because when you, um, the purge as as um, an example, um, I mean, I came from a film background. My academic background is in film, so I am so you know I, I'm eager at all times to talk about games in a more well, I don't want to say academic and sort of put a sort of loftiness to it, but you know, a, a more a more sort of philosophical and sort of analytical way. Um, but yeah, the purge is a good example. I was, um, the purge has even got to the point of sign of cultural um, relevance and acceptance. That I was watching an episode of Rick and Morty the other day, and they, there's um, a parody of the purge in there. And I think uh, if you, <laughs> I mean, if you've gotten other people to satirize your own thing, I mean, you're pretty well on the way to. Um, I mean, that's that in a way is like an, an, an analytical discussion, right? Someone else is interpreting that work in a new way. Um, I wonder, I mean, is there anything you think needs to needs to happen to games to be more to be considered alongside um, to be delved into in into that into a similar uh, depth as film is is there does there need to be is a like a lightning rod moment that needs to happen or or is it a, just a slow steady process that is or isn't currently happening already <laughs> yeah i mean i just think that um i mean people are trying to kind of like maybe put the cart before the horse like i've been saying for you know 12 years or so that you know what we need to be doing is making these these types of games right and that's it we need to make more of them we need to just make them <laughs> and there's no there's no we have no business like waving our arms in the air and say hey world you know it's culturally sophisticated world people who you know are are uh, even people who are interested in the purge <laughs> you know but but people who are uh, you know watching you know Lars von Trier or Charlie Kaufman or whatever uh, and seeing something deep and sophisticated there and you know to wave our arms at them and say hey come pay attention to our stuff over here come on why aren't you paying attention to us right like they, they would come and they would look and they would realize there's a reason they're not paying attention to us <laughs> mm. right and you know even when people like told ebert he should look at passage or told ebert he should look at flower or braid he dismissed each one of those things right like braid is a wordy fortune cookie you know flower is, expresses sentiments that you might find on a, any hall, on a hallmark greeting card <laughs> mm, mm. you know and is he you know he's not that far from the truth Sure, I mean, yeah, yeah, obviously he didn't deeply read Braid or whatever, but, you know, he, he's he's kind of, I mean, Braid is, even though I think that the text of Braid is, goes way beyond a wordy a fortune cookie, I I think it is wordy. <laughs> Braid <laughs> <Yeah>. is wordy. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so, uh, and I can't remember exactly what he said about Passage, but he's just like, this is not that profound, right? And it isn't. <laughs> It's like a little passage is like a little blip of a baby step into like some game that's actually about something, you know, I don't know. And and so, you know, I don't think like, you know, we stop at Passage or Braid or, or, or you know, Edith Finch or The Witness or Dear Esther or, you know, Stanley Parable or any of these things. I think we, you know, have to keep pushing further and further beyond and keep trying. And, you know, in the case of like, if you look at like, you know, Davey, the guy who made uh, uh, Stanley Parable, Stanley and then um, mm. Davey Reedon, yeah, uh, you know, and then made this <laughs> the Beginner's Guide, which is just like off the wall crazy, and the kind of stuff that we should be making. He also, you know, it's kind of somewhat alienated his audience a little bit there. I mean, if you look at the numbers, uh, Stanley Parable is this gigantic hit, and you know, that the Beginner's Guide is a is a is a moderate small scale hit, right? Um, but you know, he didn't. It didn't. It wasn't like this huge, even bigger commercial follow-up to the Stanley Parable, um, but yet you know 
and I don't know that he needs to make that kind of game again because the Stanley Parable was that successful. But <laughs> uh, he at least had the you know the sort of freedom to go off and do this kind of crazy thing that was just like unprecedented. Um, and yeah, the regular game audience isn't really going to be interested in it. I don't think. Um, I'm also reminded of you know Kyle Gabler starting a new company after World of Goo and making Little Inferno. <laughs> You know, which is just this completely strange, crazy thing that's unlike other games and kind of, you know, has this kind of message that's difficult to interpret and so on. Um, I mean, I think that that is the kind of stuff that, you know, these are going to be these fits and starts. And, you know, even if we look at film, the kinds of films that I'm talking about are not gigantic, huge commercial hits anyway. Right. Like Synecdoche, New York is not (laughs) is not, you know, ever going to be this mainstream thing. So it's like, well, you know, I don't know. I, I think when you just keep pushing from all angles and keep making it better and better and better and better. And, you know, I don't know if there's ever going to be a time where we can confidently say, Hey, now you can come look at us over here, (laughs) but we're certainly not there yet. I'm telling you that right now. And it's been, it's been a long time that we've been trying. For more on games and game creators, visit IndieByDesign.net and follow us on Twitter at IndieByDesign. The Indie by Design podcast is released every Wednesday and is brought to you by the writers and creators of Independent by Design, Art and Stories of Indie Game Creation. It's a hardback book and it's available now on our website. If you enjoyed the show, then please do take the time to leave us a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast platform. Music for this episode is kindly provided by Ben Prunty. 